Prime Time Crimes presents this crime education documentary featuring two real-life crime stories and I recommend watching as if you are the victim in each story. You will be able to identify the warning signs that led up to the incident. Then consider what you would do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family and leave me a comment. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained and we can move from being paranoid to being prepared. Thank you in advance for subscribing, liking and sharing this video. July 25th, 2009, Lawrenceville, Georgia. A quiet middle-class suburb northeast of Atlanta. At 8.09 a.m., local resident Carl Human receives an unexpected knock on his front door. When he went to the door, he recognized um, that it was Ashley Scott, his neighbor, was at the door. She was in basically a t-shirt and her underwear, and um, she had blood all over her. She had told him that a man had broken into her house and uh, raped her and killed her husband. Carl Human calls 911. As first responders arrive at the scene, even the most seasoned among them are taken aback by Ashley's appearance. Honestly, it, it, I thought of a scene out of Carrie. That was the first thought. Police enter Ashley's house, guns drawn. At that point in time, of course, you're not knowing whether somebody's on the other side of the door. And the house was in pretty good shape until you got to the master bedroom. As soon as you stepped to the threshold of the master bedroom, I could see the nude body of Mr. Scott laying there. I can only describe it as one of the most horrendous crime scenes that I've seen in my 20 year law enforcement career. For Greg and Ashley Scott, their life together began as teenagers in rural Whiteside County, Illinois. Greg, who was born in 1978 in Morrison, Illinois, always stood out above the crowd. He was basically like a gentle giant because he was big. He was a big built kid, tall kid, but so sweet mannered. After graduating high school, Greg worked odd jobs in town, including a stint at a local pizza parlor. He worked at uh, Casey's, he worked at, he did the pizzas. And one October day in 1999, a group of teenage girls from the church next door walked in. They'd stop there after church and hang out and flirt with him a little bit. And Ashley was the one who came over and talked with him and said, you know what, I'd go out with you. To be so forward with a boy was completely out of character for 17-year-old Ashley Rumpf. During Ashley's young life, she had a number of medical issues. She reached a point where she started gaining a lot of weight, and the bigger she got, the more she retreated, had fewer friends. Uh, I was just a lot less outgoing. She was very quiet, very timid. A lot of times seemed very withdrawn and scared to talk. But there was something about Greg that drew Ashley out of her shell that night at the pizza parlor. Her and Greg kind of hit it off pretty well with that, and then they started dating. They were both, I think, more content to just kind of hang out at home. I think their personalities just meshed and they kind of just gelled well together. Then, in the spring of 2000, after less than a year of dating, Ashley and Greg made an unexpected announcement. They came to us and said, we want to get married. I wasn't really thrilled about them getting married at that young of an age. At the time, Greg was driving his dad's pickup truck, which got about maybe eight miles to the gallon, delivering pizzas. Not a lot to build a marriage on, but I guess they were in love and decided that they could make a go of life at that point. She graduated that year, and they got married within a week after graduation. Determined to build a better life for Ashley and himself, Greg enlisted in the Army in the winter of 2001. Once he graduated from basics, he went to San Antonio for his training to be a, a vet tech in the Army. He loved his job. Absolutely loved it. He liked working with animals. I think she liked the idea of being an Army wife. She met a lot of people, a lot of the families. And it was like, I think it kind of gave her an identity. Over the next few years, Greg's job would take the couple all around the world. They were stationed in Nebraska, Kansas, and for a while, Japan. Looking back on Greg's life, I think being in Japan was probably some of the best years he really had. I think he was really doing well in the military and really understanding, hey, there's a good future for me here. Greg's success in the military would soon come to a halt 
when Ashley's health took a sudden turn for the worse. She had diabetes, and that was hard for her to control. She did the insulin shots. She had gained a considerable amount of weight since they had left. It got to the point where there was problems with her heart, and she was on the verge of having a heart attack. It was pretty scary. I just remember, I think she had to be life flighted or like helicopter flight or something into Hawaii for some sort of an emergency procedure, so I know Greg was really worried for her. Doctors were also concerned for her long-term medical well-being. They felt that given all of her medical issues that she would be better off back in the United States where she could receive the kind of treatment she needed. So she came back to Atlanta and stayed with us. When Ashley came back to the United States, she came down here in July of 04. Greg still had a certain amount of time left in Japan. He came back in December of 04 to be with Ashley. The couple took their savings and purchased a home in the Atlanta suburb of Lawrenceville. But Greg struggled to find steady work as a civilian, and Ashley's medical bills began to mount. He was incredibly depressed about it because he loved being the breadwinner. He loved being the man in the family. When he lost his job, it, he, it shook him up. In order to make ends meet, the couple rented a spare bedroom to a young woman Ashley had befriended named Deidre. They brought her into their home to help financially. I knew they were struggling. He, he mentioned that quite a bit of, hey, we got a lot of debt. How are we going to get by? Deidre's rent money helped stabilize Greg and Ashley's finances. Then, in 2008, Greg found work at a nearby veterinary clinic, and a few months later, he received a small inheritance. Greg's grandmother passed away. My sons inherited their father's part of a small inheritance. For Ashley, the money came just in time. Doctors said that a radical weight loss surgery might be necessary in order to solve some of her health problems. Greg had decided that he was going to take that money and use it for Ashley to be able to have this surgery. He took something that was given to him and gave it to her without a second thought. Ashley had surgery and she'd lost a dramatic amount of weight. In fact, when Greg and Ashley visited family in Illinois a few months later, they could hardly believe Ashley's transformation, both inside and out. I couldn't tell you how much weight she lost, but she was probably half the size of when I first met her. She felt more comfortable, more confident, was a little more outgoing. Over the next several months, the couple's life together continued to improve. Greg loved his job, Ashley's health stabilized, and she found a good paying job at a call center. That was a pretty steady income. I think both Greg and Ashley agreed that it was time for Dietra to move out of the house. They were heading in the right direction money-wise. He was excited because they were able to actually start saving money up. They were going to actually be able to build themselves up for the future. Ashley had made a Facebook posting commenting on how she was ready to have children and if they had a child, she was hoping that the child would have Greg's eyes. Sadly, Greg and Ashley would never get the chance to have children. On the morning of July 25th, 2009, police have discovered Greg's body, lifeless, on the floor of the couple's master bedroom. There was blood everywhere. Blood and it was wet and it was an awful, awful crime scene. It appeared to be stab wounds, but I didn't really know. It quite literally takes your breath away. This is the act of uh, extreme passion in the worst way. The sheer brutality of the crime is a butchering. As the CSI team cordons off the scene, police issue an all-points bulletin on Greg's alleged attacker. The most immediate concern was we had somebody that might be a threat to the neighborhood. We had to act as quickly as we could to make sure that there wasn't some crazed killer on the loose. Was the murder of Greg Scott truly the act of a bloodthirsty lunatic? Or is there more to this crime than meets the eye? We didn't have any information to who may have killed her husband. We had more questions than we had answers. By the summer of 2009, Ashley Scott and husband Greg had navigated their share of ups and downs and were hopeful for what the future had in store. After he got his job working as a back tap, you know, it was starting to go up from there. But on the morning of July 25th, 2009, the Scott's perfect life was shattered in an act of violence, one that claimed Greg's life and left Ashley emotionally devastated. When I arrived along with another officer, there were already two officers on scene. The female party who was later identified as Ashley should, she was covered in blood and she was intermittently crying. While the coroner's team processes Greg's body, Ashley gives police a brief statement about the attack. Her demeanor was kind of sporadic, kind of a mixture of emotions. 
She looked like somebody that had just been through a tremendous uh, struggle or traumatic event. There was no steady crying. There was no, there were no steady statements. Then we also had the, the complicated issue of her being a victim and any injuries that she may have sustained. According to Ashley, the attack began shortly after 3 a.m. She said that an unknown black male, one person, had come through the open garage door at about 3 a.m. Greg woke her up and told her that he heard a noise inside the house. She said that he got up out of bed and that he started to make his way to the bedroom door, which was closed, and he made it about halfway to the bedroom door when a black male entered the bedroom door and immediately stabbed him. He basically held her hostage and over the course of a couple hours had raped her and had made her watch him kill her husband. It's clear the entire ordeal has taken a toll on Ashley. And she had just undergone a traumatic series of events. The primary concern shifted to her safety and her medical status. As Ashley is transported to a nearby hospital, police intensify their search for the attacker. The most immediate concern was the tactical concern as far as whether or not we had somebody that had killed her husband and, and might be a threat to the neighborhood. I was completely shocked. I, I didn't understand what could bring somebody to do this, and let alone to him, with how nice he was. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I think I initially thought that it was a, a robbery that had gone bad and that they ended up raping her and killing him because they didn't have anything to offer them. Meanwhile, at the crime scene, Detective Roy Mangrum and his men are examining the gruesome physical evidence. Greg was stabbed 38 times and beat in the head with a hammer. His wrist and throat were also cut. In his mid-torso and lower portion of his torso, you had some of the intestines that were protruding from the body. It was a prolonged, sustained attack on him. The body was just in horrible condition. Not far from Greg's body, detectives make an unusual discovery. According to police, a, a, a sex toy had fallen onto the ground. There was a lot about the crime scene that didn't make sense. There was no ransacking of drawers. There was no evidence that somebody was, was looking for something of value. In addition to the peculiar nature of the crime scene, detectives soon realized the entire room is drenched in water. There was a lot of water everywhere, and we could not understand why. As CSI document this bizarre scene, detectives make another important discovery in Greg and Ashley's kitchen. We found the cell phones in the microwave. Looked like they were being hidden in there. So if Greg maybe was to escape, he wouldn't be able to find his cell phone to call the police. While crime scene techs collect the phones in hopes that the data on them can be recovered, police continue to fan out across the neighborhood, searching for anyone who might have seen something out of the ordinary in the hours leading up to the crime. This was a quiet place, from what I understand from neighbors. It was not the place where, where violence is to be expected whatsoever. Winnett County isn't Mayberry by any means, but this was a pocket of quietude and of kind of suburban normalcy where this sort of thing sent shockwaves through the immediate neighborhood as evidenced by what neighbors had to say immediately following what happened. We would ask him, have you seen this couple fighting or have you seen any problems here? Have you seen anybody that might have entered the house? And at that point, the answers that we were receiving was no, nobody had seen anything. There wasn't anything out of the unusual. But just as investigators hit a wall with eyewitnesses, they receive word that Ashley's condition has improved and she wants to amend her initial statement. Her story was starting to evolve instead of it being one black male that had entered the house, that it may have been two. Having dealt with a lot of people in traumatic instances, everybody treats uh, trauma and grief differently. The time I thought I would go was just one person because all I saw was one person. Okay, so then the second black guy comes in. Does he say anything? Mm -hmm. I heard something. I heard him say something, but I didn't see him at first because he was standing on the other side of the entertainment center. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really see him. Ashley also informs detectives that the two men were wearing yellow hoodies and were armed with knives, which Ashley believes were taken from the kitchen. They started talking about how much fun it was going to be, what they were going to do, which just basically boiled down to they were going to rape me. Greg started fighting with this guy once he figured out what they were going to do. Greg would have put up a fight just to protect Ashley. It was his nature. He he was a protector. He would definitely fought to protect anybody that he cared about. 
they knocked into the dresser. So when they hit into it, one of the doors opened. And that's where Greg keeps all of his toys. Toys? What kind of toys? Adult toys. And that's when um, the larger guy decided that it would be fun to play with them. Greg started fighting. So they, the smaller guy, stabbed him again, threw him on the bed, and held the knife to his throat. I quit arguing because I didn't want... I didn't want Greg to get hurt anymore. According to Ashley, they used the sex toy on her. He used the toy for a couple of minutes. I was unresponsive. He wasn't He wasn't happy with how I was reacting. So at that point, he said he quit. He walked around, stood over Greg. When she would not respond, they kept stabbing him. Some of them were deeper than others. Some of them weren't. I mean, he's still talking. He's still breathing. I can hear, I I can hear the gurgling when he breathes in and out. And I can see a lot of blood and bubbles coming from a couple of the ones up here. And then that's when I can see the intestines coming out. But then they quit standing for a while. And he was really, really pale. And his face was sweating. He was close to dying. Ashley says at that point, the attackers offered Greg a bone-chilling choice. They tried to make him choose how he was going to die. Do you want to, do you want to suffocate? Do you want to drown? What do you want to do? So he said he didn't care what they did as long as they promised to let me go. On July 25th, 2009, at a hospital outside Atlanta, 27-year-old Ashley Scutt recounts for police the harrowing attack on her and her husband, Greg, an attack that ultimately claimed Greg's life. She said that two black men stormed the house and brutally murdered her husband and also raped her but did not kill her. They tried to make him choose how he was going to die. Do you want to suffocate? Do you want to drown? What do you want to do? They said that he didn't care what they did as long as they promised to let me go. They made her fill a bucket full of water and then they poured the water into his mouth. She said that they tried to drown him. How long did this go on? Ashley says that after what seemed like hours of painful torture, Greg was still alive. So their captors decided to finish him off with a claw hammer. The last time that they hit, I just heard this really, really gross, gross sound. And I heard Greg gasp once. I heard it gurgle. He wasn't, he couldn't, he wasn't saying anything. He was moving his legs, but they were like thrashing, but he wasn't moving his arms anymore. And then they hit him one more time and put him moving. They both just sat there and kind of stared at him for maybe five minutes to see if he was done. And every once in a while, it's like he would gasp, but it wasn't in rhythm. It wasn't normal. It wasn't anything. I really honestly thought that when they were done with him, that it was, it was, it was going to be my turn. Ashley says that for some reason, the killers spared her life. They grabbed me by my arms, told me to stand in the closet, my closet. He told me I was lucky that's all I was getting. He wasn't prone to injuring women. That it took a, an awful lot of motivation and evil in order for that to, to have occurred the way that it did. What investigators still can't figure out is why were Ashley and Greg targeted in the first place? Crime can happen anywhere and does, but it did not make sense why they chose this house, this time of day, of this family to terrorize. You have to be able to always consider alternative theories. I think that if you get stuck with any one theory and you don't give some plausibility to the others, then then you may be doing an injustice. It could have been anything from drugs, which is a common occurrence. They come for, for drugs or they come for cash. There could have been some marital strife that involved extramarital relationships and an outside party being involved with that. Before they can answer those questions, detectives must contact Greg's mother, Betty Scott. They asked if I was the mother of Greg Scott, and I said, yes, I am. They said, there's been an accident, and your son's been killed. I threw down the phone and said, you can't tell me that my son's dead. I can still remember the call like it was yesterday. Mom was just 
She was frantic, just out of sorts. After informing family members of the crime, detectives begin looking into Greg and Ashley's inner circle for leads. Deidre was a friend of Ashley's back in Sterling, Illinois, and she lived with Ashley and Greg for several years. According to those close to Greg and Ashley, Deidre's rent money wasn't worth some of the trouble she brought with her into the house. She had some problems with drugs. They didn't like the idea of her messing with drugs in their home. So it was a mutual agreement between Greg and Ashley to ask Deidre to move out. Deidre wasn't happy that she got kicked out. I think Deidre was surprised that Ashley did that because they'd been, you know, friends for so long. They had a few words. She had started kind of running with some of the different crowd of people. Immediately, detectives need to track down Deidre for more information. When questioned by police, Deidre admits that she left Ashley and Greg's house on bad terms. But she says that within a few months, she and Ashley had patched things up. They weren't real close there for a few months, I'd say, but then they, they did get back together and, and became friends again. Deidre tells detectives that if they're looking for answers, they might want to take a closer look at Greg. Deidre never really cared for Greg because of the verbal and emotional abuse that, that Ashley received from him. Deidre had lived with them for a little while, and she saw the abuse as well that Ashley had endured with Greg. Some people probably would say that Greg was a gentle giant, but he wasn't very gentle. He wanted to show his strength and was very aggressive towards Ashley. Greg had a temper. He was very impatient. But with Deidre being there, she was kind of a buffer between the two of them. In light of Deidre's allegations, detectives check police reports for any domestic disturbance calls at the Scott residence. There were no police calls for service out there, no domestics, no reports of any kind. There's no paper trail in terms of uh, hard evidence of there being any uh, documented physical abuse by police, but it's not uncommon for women to obviously be quiet uh, about things that are happening out of fear of what their significant other might do to them or what that knowledge might do to their family. That afternoon, detectives reach out to Ashley's parents, Al and Donna Rompf, and ask them point blank about the abuse allegations. Ashley's parents say that her and Greg's relationship was anything but a fairy tale romance. In fact, they sensed trouble between Greg and Ashley from the moment they got married back in 2000. She couldn't do her hair, she couldn't wear makeup. He didn't want anybody looking at her when she left the house. He had many, many times told her, you're fat, you're ugly, nobody's gonna want you. He wouldn't let her have any friends, wouldn't let her go out, wouldn't let her do anything really. Ashley's parents claim that as the years went on, the abuse got worse. At that point in her life, Ashley was having frequent accidents. We had suspicions that they weren't all accidents. A lot of her medical problems are because of Greg. She lost so much hair from all the stress that she was under. She gained so much weight because of the way he treated her. She was introverted and didn't have much self-confidence to begin with. And by the time he got through with her, she had nothing. According to Ashley's parents, the abuse continued even after the couple's fortunes took a turn for the better. Just two weeks before Greg's murder, Ashley told them she wanted to end things with Greg, but was afraid of what he'd do to her if she tried. He told her that if she tried to leave, that he would slit her throat before she cleared the garage door. When I talked to her about calling a lawyer, the last thing I said was, be sure you don't say anything to him because we didn't want her to pay the price, and we never knew for sure what that price was going to be. Could Greg's death be the result of Ashley's growing fear pushing her over the edge? She did tell me that she was definitely afraid, and she just felt she couldn't leave. Married people sometimes don't get along. I've worked homicides where there was domestic abuse involved. There was a good possibility that Ashley was the suspect. It's been less than 24 hours since Greg Scott was discovered beaten and stabbed to death inside his own home. Detectives have been working the theory that two intruders overpowered and murdered Greg. But now, with new revelations, their focus is beginning to shift. Much of Ashley's story was really odd. Uh, she claimed at first that, that uh, there was one intruder, then, then there's two intruders. 
There are no signs of forced entry inside the house. In fact, doors were locked from the inside. The crime scene was relatively confined to the master bedroom. There were valuables that were in view, things of a personal nature that were out in the open that just, they didn't seem to fit what had been described. You keep an open mind that anything is possible, but on the surface, what I was seeing did not appear to match up with the initial story that she had given. When police see the official crime scene report, it offers a critical clue about a possible motive for the attack on Greg. At the base of the fireplace, there was an engagement ring and a wedding band, along with a man's wedding band. And there was a picture of a couple that had been ripped in half. Suspects in home invasions won't take and rip up a photo. They won't take their rings and throw them on the floor. Investigators decide to pay Ashley another visit at Gwinnett Medical Center. When they arrive, the head nurse clues them in on a stunning revelation. I met with the nurse who did the exam, and she told me that there was no trauma or no evidence that a rape occurred. I realized that I needed to actually talk to Ashley myself. Once Ashley Scott is discharged from the hospital, investigators take her to the station for a formal interview. Detectives ask Ashley to describe the true nature of her relationship with Greg. Ashley told me that she was a, a battered woman. She told me that he would get mad at her about the money problems. He will not get abusive. And only, only be one time and he apologize and then it would be fine for six months, seven months. Ashley also admits that her initial statement about the attack on Greg was fabricated. Is that the reason you made up that story? It's just what came out. She had to make up a story. What the real story was, it was too much for her. And I remember telling her, saying, Ashley, I need you to tell me the truth. I need you to tell me exactly what had happened. She became more quiet. She said that she actually killed her husband, Greg. Ashley says that the incident began around 1 a.m. on July 25th, shortly after she arrived home from work. I think one thing just led to another, and he was going to hit her. She told him, you know, you hit me, and this is going to be the last time. I took my rings off of my side stand. told him I was going to see him to bless the Lord. The rings and the, the picture laying on the floor, it just kind of tied everything together. Ashley tells police that she then began to pack a suitcase and that Greg pursued her with a knife in his hand. He said that if I was going to get a divorce, he would not live through it, but he could take me with him. He could live it through. Ashley says that she grabbed the closest weapon she could find, a claw hammer that happened to be sitting on the dresser. I had the hammer in my hand. Ashley tells investigators that she hit Greg in the head until he dropped the knife, at which point she picked it up and ran towards the hallway, with Greg not far behind her. She had the knife, and she turned around really fast and did not realize that Greg was so close behind her, and she accidentally stabbed him in the stomach. Ashley tells police that when she saw the knife sticking out of Greg's stomach, years of bottled up rage came flowing out of her. They just stabbed him several more times. You said till I, I think you said till he stopped moving. Because he quit trying to get up. According to Ashley, shortly after that, she realized what she did, and in a panic, tried to make the scene look like a deadly home invasion. She just lost all control. I don't even think she was conscious when she did it. Ashley's story is true, then could Greg's murder actually be a justified act of self-defense? Investigators hope the forensics lab has some answers from the cell phones found in the couple's microwave. Based on the data retrieved from Greg's phone, Greg sent a single text message at 1.39 a.m. to someone listed only as Cam. When police call the number, they learn that Cam is Greg's best friend, Cameron Johnson. I got a call from, I believe it was Detective Mangrum. And he said he needed to speak with me. According to Cameron, in the moments just before the attack, he and Greg were chatting online. Greg and I were online playing Zanga poker. Cameron states that around 1.30, Ashley arrived home from work, which means it was time for Greg to wrap things up. 
He told them that Ashley was home and they got offline. Greg was completely normal. Nothing like nothing was out of the norm. What is unusual, according to Cameron, is Ashley's claim of self-defense. There is no way in heck that he would ever have touched her in any way other than loving. In fact, Cameron tells detectives that if anyone in the relationship was abusive, it was Ashley. When Ashley lost the weight, her personality changed. She became more obsessed with herself. She was no longer quiet and shy and reserved. She was now more pushy and very overbearing with Greg. She controlled his time and what he was basically allowed to do. From doing interviews with his co-workers, they told me that she was not a very pleasant person towards him. She was not a nice person towards him. In speaking with Greg's other friends and family members, investigators get the impression that boredom, rather than abuse, was what was driving Ashley away from Greg. She was a senior in high school when she met Greg, so I think there was probably something in her mind mentally that, hey, I, you know, I want to go find out if, if I'm attractive to anyone other than Greg. Ultimately, she desired to have a life away from my cousin, you know, start all over with the new body and be single. I'm not aware that they had problems with anybody, both at, at work or at home. I, I really don't know what the, the motive was. It's one of those things that I, I'm not sure that anybody will have the answer other than this should. Thankfully, the autopsy results shed some much-needed light on the case. Greg didn't have any defense wounds on himself, and especially with a knife attack. That's, that's something that's highly unusual. I could understand why a big guy would let his little wife stab him to death. According to the autopsy, Greg was most likely asleep at the time of the attack. Toxicology reports revealed that Greg had uh, sleeping pills in his system. The amount of Ambion that was in his system was much more than anybody would ever have taken. They actually called me and asked me, would he take anything to help him sleep? They mentioned the drug Ambion, and I said, I think Ashley takes Ambion. He had to get that Ambien in his system, so I believe she made him dinner, and then he had passed out, and then after he had got to where he could not defend himself anymore is when she decided she was going to kill him. He had been put into a state where it would make it very difficult for him to defend himself. When he was at a point where he was the most vulnerable, he was attacked, and he perished in her hands. Ashley had stabbed him dozens of times, upwards of almost 40 times and then bashed him about the head with a small hammer. This screams a crime of passion. She tried to clean up that crime scene, and when she realized that it was just too overwhelming, she had to think in her mind, how am I going to introduce the water? How am I going to introduce the knife? With the evidence indicating a premeditated attack, investigators charge Ashley Scutt with the first-degree murder of her husband. I told her that she was under arrest and that I'd be arresting her for murder. For those closest to the couple, news of Ashley's arrest is polarizing. When I was told that his wife was arrested and was allegedly the one who had done it, it made all the sense in the world that it was her. There's no one else that would have even wanted any kind of harm to Greg other than somebody who just wanted him to not be around anymore. When we were informed that she had been charged with murder, we were in shock. I don't believe my daughter is guilty of murder in any way, shape, or form. On April 25th, 2011, Ashley Scott stands trial in a Gwinnett County, Georgia courtroom for the death of her husband, Greg, who was brutally beaten and stabbed to death in 2009. If convicted, Ashley could face life in prison. In their opening statement, Prosecutors assert that after Ashley's dramatic weight loss surgery, she yearned to start a new life without Greg. But instead of filing for divorce, Ashley murdered him in order to be free of him forever. They felt that Ashley didn't want to wait for a divorce, so she just drugged him and killed him. I want to believe that something in her just went haywire. Ashley's defense counters by asserting she was a victim of years of domestic abuse and only killed Greg out of self-defense. Ashley's supporters, and especially her defense attorney, um, claim that there were years of abuse behind her actions that were really driving her to this extreme. To support their claim, Ashley's attorneys call her to the witness stand. Fighting back tears, Ashley tells the jury that despite coming across as a gentle giant, Greg was a controlling, domineering man who'd rather see Ashley dead than grant her a divorce. 
Ashley's testimony seemed to be going as planned. This woman who'd been suffering, who'd been kind of a social recluse, who only had her husband to lean on, and this husband was a very hurtful individual. Ashley's testimony seems to resonate with the jury. Juries tend to side on the side of battered women. Everything seemed to be going well for Ashley. On cross-examination, prosecutors point to the sleeping pills in Greg's system, as well as the lack of defensive wounds on his body, as proof that the attack against him wasn't one of self-defense. I don't have any, any doubt in my mind whatsoever that she was the person that committed the crime and that it was done with cold-hearted premeditation. As prosecutors cross-examine Ashley, a change appears to come over her. She became very short with her answers. She was snapping back. The change was so dramatic, I remember having goosebumps. On May 5th, 2011, the jury returns with their verdict. They find Ashley Scutt guilty on all counts. She received a life sentence with parole, which in the state of Georgia is 30 years. She was shaking. You could tell she was just as surprised as we were. She was given an additional 35 years for aggravated assault, possession of a knife during the commission of a crime, and false statements. Ashley's supporters haven't given up hope of an appeal, but for Greg's family, Ashley is right where she belongs. Was I satisfied with the life in prison plus 35 years? Yes, I, I, I'm satisfied with that. Ashley took something that I can never get back. To know that Ashley will never get out during my lifetime, that gives me some satisfaction. October 14th, 2011. It's early Friday morning in the town of Liberty, South Carolina. Just before sunrise, police receive a frantic 911 call. I have just received a call from my sister, Susan Hendricks, on Pinedale Road in Liberty. She told me that my nephew had shot himself. We got a call that the subject had committed suicide with a firearm. Something like this involving a firearm um, where somebody has apparently been shot. We are going to respond, license irons, respond code three. Minutes later, police deputy Brandon Ferris arrives on the scene. Evelyn Burns was on the porch and was directing me inside. She was frantic, she was emotional, she was crying. She said that Matthew had shot himself. When I first went into the home, I were third to female, sitting in the living room floor. Kind of had a cold, blank stare on her face. I thought maybe she was just in shock. Evelyn explains that the shell-shocked woman is Matthew's mother, Susan Hendricks, who discovered her son's lifeless body in the back bedroom roughly 15 minutes earlier. I observed Matthew Hendricks in the back bedroom with a gunshot wound to the head. He was obviously deceased. He's underneath the covers in his bed, um, almost looked as though he was sleeping. I saw a bunch of blood leading from the front door into a bedroom. I get there and I see the female. We find Linda Burns laying in bed on her back, and she has multiple gunshot wounds. My initial thoughts were, it's a murder-suicide. Investigators soon discover this unthinkable tragedy is only the beginning for Susan Hendricks. As a hard-working mother of two, Susan Hendricks had always strived to build the best life possible for her family. But growing up, Susan lived through very hard times. Her father worked in a mill, and I think her mother stayed home with him. But the mother had some mental health issues, and it wasn't a good stay-at-home life for the kids. As she got older, it's my understanding the house caught on fire, and her mother passed away in that fire. Not long after that, she started taking care of her father. Tending to her father and her younger siblings was hard on Susan, but it also made her determined to find success on her own terms. She was actually a smart person, an intelligent person. Susan was in control of her life. After Susan graduated high school, her father remarried, which gave her even more freedom to pursue her dreams. She enrolled at a nearby college, where she quickly began working toward multiple degrees. She went for criminal justice, she went for psychiatry, she went for nursing. She was a very smart lady. By the time 
she finished college, Susan had earned degrees in business, criminal justice, and the arts, as well as an associate's degree in machine tool technology. It was the latter degree that afforded Susan the best opportunity, working as a machinist for General Electric. The job gave Susan the chance to expand her horizons far beyond her hometown of Liberty. She did a lot of traveling. She went to Finland and lots of places and would stay gone months at a time. It was at work that Susan met Mark Hendricks. Like Susan, Mark was a machinist at the company and a fellow South Carolina native. Mark was loving, would give you the shirt off his back. Goofy, funny, always had something to say. You had a terrible day, he always knew how to make it 10 times better than what it was. She used to say all the time that she was attracted to Mark because of his personality. She was very quiet, he was very outgoing. That was a challenge to him, so it was, well, let me bring her out of her shell. Because he was all about everybody, love and life. Susan didn't hesitate to embrace Mark's carpe diem attitude. And just a few weeks after they began dating, the couple made a surprise announcement. They were telling us they were getting married. It was snowing like crazy the day they got married. But she wasn't going to stop. They couldn't wait till the snow cleared up or anything else. They had to go that day. Shortly after the wedding, the couple moved into a house on property owned by Mark's parents and wasted no time starting a family of their own. Their first son, Matthew, was born in 1988. Three years later, they welcomed another son, Marshall, into the world. Matt and Marshall lived right next door to us. Matt was like my little brother because I didn't have little siblings, so he was my little brother. Marshall definitely got his personality from his daddy as far as the outgoing, goofy, wants to make everybody laugh. Matthew was more of the quiet guy, but once you got to know him, he was just as goofy as his daddy and Marshall were. Though she had two rambunctious boys at home, Susan had no desire to put work life on the back burner to become a stay-at-home mom. And over the next several years, her career skyrocketed. Susan had a good job making good money. She had to leave Mark and the boys at home for six months to go travel to Finland. Mark, he let her go do her thing, and he stayed home with the boys and did his thing. And they just slowly drifted apart that way. In 1998, after over a decade of marriage, Mark and Susan had drifted so far apart that they decided to separate. A year later, the divorce was finalized, and Susan purchased a home next door to her father and stepmother back in Liberty. Susan decided to take her sons with her. The move devastated Mark. That was a very rough time for Mark because their whole existence, he had been the main caretaker for them. Mark missed his voice a lot. At first, everything about the new arrangement seemed to be working out well for Susan, but the boys struggled to adjust. Matt and Marshall didn't talk much about the split up between their parents. They both kind of got into the wrong crowds, as kids do. Matthew was your typical teenager that has too many issues and nobody helps him with them, and he turned to partying. He was drinking and smoking pot, and that started probably at 13. Soon after the move, Susan's father passed away. Now struggling to keep her family intact, Susan reached out to her ex-husband with an unorthodox proposal asking him to move in next door to her and the boys. He moved back down to her father's trailer so that he could be close to the boys. Mark always tried to be cordial with her. His outlook on that was, we have children together. That was their mom. So he, around her, seemed fine, like everything was great. Indeed, the living arrangement seemed to provide a stabilizing force for the family. By 2009, Matthew had enrolled in college, while Marshall was forging his own path. Marshall wanted to be an apprentice at a tattoo shop or somewhere like that just so he could draw for them. His passion was art. There's a plant in Liberty that he drew the sign for that they still have up today. As for Matthew, he had decided to follow in his mother's footsteps as a machinist. Matt was going to graduate in December with a welding degree from Tri-County Tech. He was fixed to graduate, top of his class in welding. Sadly, Matthew would not make it to his graduation day. At the time, we were under the impression that this was potentially a murder-suicide. As 
As detectives process the scene, it's clear that Susan is in a state of shock. I had asked her a couple questions about, you know, what, what kind of stuff was he doing the night before. She said he, he kept telling me that I'm a good mother. He just, he just kept telling me that I'm a good mother. As EMTs tend to Susan, her sister Evelyn begs police to check the house next door. She became very concerned of the people in the neighboring residence, which is Susan's other sons and her ex-husband. By 2011, Susan Hendricks and her ex-husband Mark had rebounded from their divorce and parlayed an unorthodox living arrangement into one in which often troubled sons, Matthew and Marshall, were finally thriving. She said, you can stay in my father's old trailer by blow the house and you can be in the boys' lives every day because that's what it's supposed to be. But on October 14th, 2011, Mark and Susan's life is upended when police respond to a 911 call at Susan's house and discover the body of her 23-year-old son, Matthew, as well as the remains of Susan's stepmother, Linda Burns. As paramedics and police try to get a handle on this horrific scene, worries surface that Matthew and Linda may not be the only casualties. She said, we have family that live down there. They should be up here. Somebody needs to go check on them. I had already asked for other units to respond. Um, when, when they did arrive, I directed them to that residence to check that scene. There's a small patio in front of the front door, and I can see a blanket, and it appears to be a body underneath the blanket. I would later learn that that's Marshall Hendricks, the younger son of Susan Hendricks. He was on a concrete porch kind of slab, laying there with a gunshot wound. He was deceased. They then entered the residence and observed another male subject. The other older male subject was laying on a couch and had one gunshot wound straight into the heart. And he was laying there like he was just asleep. The deceased is identified as 52-year-old Mark Hendricks. So basically, we had almost two separate crime scenes. They had to rope off their crime scene down there as well. Once the crime scenes are secured, investigators' next move is to speak with Susan Hendricks. She's the first and only witness to her son's alleged crime and still seems traumatized by what's transpired. Susan Hendricks was with the medics, so I go in the back of the van with her and start speaking with her, asking her questions about what had taken place. I asked her if she heard any noises throughout the night or anything, and she denied hearing any gunshots or anything. According to Susan, she took a sleeping pill just before midnight and didn't wake up until 6 a.m. I was waking up, started coughing, and as I walked by the kitchen table, I saw a paper laying there. So I went and got a pen and I went to look at it and I realized it was a letter from Matthew. Then I saw some of the blood in the floor and I took off to his room. said that not enough people had wished him happy birthday and that he kind of felt like nobody cared. She said that she ran into the bedroom, found Matthew with a gun laying beside him. Susan says it took her several minutes to realize that her stepmother, Linda, was also dead. Susan had found Linda actually back in the bed and, and shot more times. On the dining table, Sergeant Taylor and his men find the note, which seems to confirm Susan's story. It didn't really go into detail about committing suicide. It more so had to do with how good of a mother she had been, how he would always remember her. But it's what the note doesn't explain that has investigators baffled. The entire day while I was out there on scene, running through my head is, why is only one person still alive? Why is everybody down here dead? And Susan is the only one still alive. We decided that because overall circumstances we had, 
we needed to get a search warrant to be on the safe side of anything we collected, anything we saw, anything we heard from that point on. While police wait for a judge to sign off on the search warrants, other members of the Hendricks family arrive at the scene. I woke up that morning to get my kids ready for school, and the phone rang, and it was my mother. And she was on the other end of the line, and she said, they're all dead, Steph. At that time, there was no processing anything. It was just like you had just took my heart and ripped it right out of me. When we got there, the reporters were there and police everywhere. Liberty is one of the smaller communities in Pickens County. I think the word to describe it would be sleepy. I mean, this doesn't happen in Liberty. I was trying to determine, you know, do we have a suspect that's at large? Do we have a concern for the safety of the community? But investigators make it clear to both the press and the Hendricks family that until further notice, they're treating the case as a murder-suicide. The tone coming from the sheriff's office during the initial investigation was isolated incident. There's not a killer on the loose. The investigation did focus on Matthew from the get-go. That afternoon, detectives obtained their search warrants, and forensic techs begin processing both houses. The first victim that I encountered was Marshall Hendricks. He was laying face down on the front porch, and he was covered with a blanket. He had three gunshot wounds. One was to his chest, one was to his abdomen, and one was to his arm. I said, who covered that body? And everybody's like, it was like that when we got here. And I'm like, so the body was covered by the shooter? Which, you know, kind of to me meant that whoever did this just didn't want him to be seen. Somebody may have shot this person, but they also may have had some feelings for this person. Uh, and they didn't want their body displayed out on the front porch. Mark Hendricks, when we, we find him, he's laying on his back on a couch. I don't know if he ever knew that anything happened. However, then through the residence, there's also a series of holes in the wall, some in the cabinets, some in the drywall, that kind of lead towards the front door. And just outside that front door is where Marshall Hendricks was found. It appears as though he was attempting to flee the scene. We went down to the bottom trailer to the second residence. I observed the blood in the living room. It's like two trails of blood. And then the blood ends at Linda's room. The blood droplets actually almost make a, a U-shape and then come back in. And then inside her bedroom, we find in the closet where a lot of blood had pooled up. She had three abdomen shots, and they were in different quadrants in her body. She had one in her back and one in her arm. So she was shot numerous times. Matthew only had a single gunshot wound to the head. There was no evidence of trauma. There was no evidence of defense wounds or anything on him. The lack of defensive wounds seemed to corroborate the theory that Matthew took his own life. But the location of the weapon raises a red flag. How did the gun get in a nice, neat position laying on the nightstand? If you shoot yourself, you're just going to fall with the gun. The gun's not miraculously going to go spinning in the air and fall nice and neat on a nightstand. Also, the location of the gunshot wound itself strikes investigators as odd. Matthew was shot in the head, but it was at a strange place for a suicide. It was more to the back of the head further back than normal. Investigators eventually discover the answer to part of the mystery lies with Susan. She said that she took the gun from off the bed and laid it on the dresser beside the bed. Well, it's not ideal uh, for, for anyone to move anything before we get there, but it's not unusual either. For evidence purposes, it's going to throw a little bit of a wrinkle into it because she may have put her prints on it. She may have put her DNA on the gun by moving it, and that's just something we have to deal with. The gun is bagged as evidence, along with shell casings found throughout both houses. For good measure, detectives document Susan's clothing and also swab her hands for gunshot residue. I conducted what is a, called a gunshot residue test, or a GSR test. They perform the same test on the clothing of Matthew Hendricks. As the evidence is transported to the crime lab, detectives turn their attention to Matthew's possible motive. There's a allegation that an individual had shot his entire family and subsequently shot himself. So naturally, we're interested in the mental state of Matthew in the 24 hours leading up to this. That's when Susan Hendricks provides police with the most critical piece of information yet. Investigators in Pickens County
County, South Carolina, are investigating what appears to be a murder-suicide. We were under the impression that this was potentially a murder-suicide and that Matthew Hendricks had shot himself and had potentially shot the other individuals. She had told me um, that Matthew had written a note and left it on the counter. To help better understand Matthew's state of mind and his alleged motive for committing the crime, detectives bring his mother, Susan Hendricks, down to the station for a formal interview. Susan says that even though Matthew was scheduled to graduate from welding school in a few months, all was not well in his world. He was just very, very sad. What about the way life's going right now? He can't get a job, he can't get ahead, can't meet him, go out and date because he don't have driver's license. I just sat down and cried the other night. I sat down and cried. Susan then details for detectives the events of the previous evening. She says that after noticing just how despondent Matthew was on his birthday, she and Mark gathered the whole family at Mark's house in order to pray for Matthew. A lot of times we pray together. I know this sounds pretty freaking bizarre, but we pray together a lot. There's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, Matthew had been so down in the house. I said, guys, we really need to pray to So we held hands and prayed together. We just prayed for each other. Guys. This included Mark Hendricks, Marshall Hendricks, Matthew Hendricks, and of course Susan Hendricks. The only person that resided between those two homes that wasn't there was Linda Burns. Susan says that after they were done praying, she and Matthew headed back to her house. She stated that actually she had stayed up and, and he had kind of periodically come in and out of her room. She wanted to stay up so she could talk with him and, and help him through some of the issues that he was having. But Susan said that over the course of the evening, it became clear that Matthew was intoxicated. She stated that he was high and drunk and, you know, he, he seemed somewhat upset. He had made statements that he was going to harm himself, but she didn't think he would actually carry those out. I can't understand why it pushed Matthew that far unless he was just so stuck he didn't know what he was doing. When detectives speak with Matthew's other friends and relatives, they get a much different picture of Matthew than the one Susan painted. None of them really conveyed the same concerns regarding his mental well-being that Susan conveyed. He was proud that he had went back to school and got his GED and went to Tri-County to get as far as he had. He just had too much to live for to actually take his own life. Matt just wouldn't do that. Matter of fact, one individual who I spoke with had even stated that Matthew had made a plan to come over and work out with him. This was not really indicative of an individual who kind of had long-term plans to commit suicide. But Marshall's girlfriend, Kelsey, tells detectives the most intriguing story. Kelsey stated that the night before she was there with Marshall at his daddy's. When asked about how things were, she stated that they were fairly jovial. I, I believe there was some wrestling going on. They were playing video games, and, and there was nothing really that gave her a lot of concern at that point. She was talking about how everything was great between all of them. Kelsey says she was at the house most of the night, and not once during the course of the evening did she see Susan or Matthew. Kelsey and Marshall had gone out to eat that evening and even came back home. But she said everything was like any other normal day for them before she left. Kelsey said that she left that night right before midnight. Kelsey also tells police that when she tried calling Marshall a few hours later, she got no answer, which was highly unusual. Every morning at 4 o'clock, Kelsey would call Marshall to make sure he was up for work. And when she called that morning at 4, Marshall never answered the phone. So I would say the murders of Matthew, Marshall, and Mark and Linda happened between midnight and 4 o'clock. Investigators hope the results of Matthew Hendricks' autopsy can shed some light on what transpired. And on October 16th, two days after the shooting, the coroner's report lands on their desk. Also found out that he was right-handed. That didn't match with the wound that he had to the back of his head. It was to the left side. If you're going to commit suicide, you're going to just go ahead with your dominant hand majority of the time. This, we could not rule a suicide. At that point, we began to investigate it more so as a murder. We did regroup refocus and, and begin to explore, you know, possible assailants. And naturally, through those discussions, there was concerns about Susan Hendricks. She's a lone survivor. 
On October 19th, investigators again interview Susan Hendricks. Instead of pointing the finger at her, they ask her if she can think of anyone who might have wanted to murder her family and frame her oldest son for the crime. I advised her that we were no longer looking at this case as a suicide and we were looking as, at it as a homicide situation. That's when she answered, well, they, they have a drug dealer that they buy the drugs from. Susan tells investigators that both her sons and her ex-husband smoked marijuana and that a drug dealer named Thomas had delivered drugs to their home on multiple occasions. Well, we begin to talk to people close to, to Matthew and, and ask about Thomas. We checked with our narcotics guys. We went several locations throughout the county, even in through Anderson County. We're just trying to find anybody that could be associated with Matthew Mark or Marshall. Investigators are unable to locate any area drug dealers who go by the name Thomas. And the more they consider the evidence, the more skeptical they are that the murders were drug-related. Why would somebody shoot somebody and cover the body? There was a, that was a red flag all the way. It was just those little touches that, that seemed like this killer knew these people. The only survivor was Susan Hendricks. She's the one we've got to focus on as far as any evidence that we can collect. When police in Liberty, South Carolina, responded to a 911 call at Susan Hendricks' property, they thought they were at the scene of a horrific murder-suicide carried out by Susan's son, Matthew. A crime which also claimed the lives of Susan's other son, Marshall, her ex-husband, Mark, and her stepmother, Linda Burns. However, the coroner's report has confirmed that Matthew Hendricks didn't commit suicide which has led investigators to focus on another suspect, the crime's sole survivor. There's mounting concern amongst friends and family that Susan Hendricks might be involved. And it's through those close to Susan that investigators discover that Susan has some serious skeletons in her closet. It's my understanding that someone abused her in a sexual manner when she was smaller. It wasn't something that was spoke about too often. It was always behind shut doors. In fact, friends say that it wasn't until Susan became a working mother who spent long stretches away from her family that the emotional horrors of her past began to resurface. Susan had been abused throughout her childhood, and as a coping mechanism, she had developed several personalities. Friends and loved ones also tell police that even though Susan sought treatment and medication in order to manage her mental illness, life under her roof could be challenging. It was just an up and down roller coaster ride. You never knew what was going to happen. I've heard numerous times, of, and my son was actually there for one of the times, that she actually pulled out a gun and told them if they all didn't get out of her house, she would kill them. And the time that my son was there, she actually did shoot at their feet to get them to leave. Ten minutes later, I could show up there and she'd be like, hey, how are you? Like nothing had ever happened. Susan was just a different breed. <laughs> I mean, one minute it could be something super nice, one minute it was a whole different mood. Apparently, no relationship was more strained than the one between Susan and her oldest son, Matthew. She kind of controlled the limit of Matthew's time with his daddy and that hurt Matthew. Because Matthew and his daddy were very close. It was real hard on him. But he turned all of it around and said, you know what? I'm going to go to school and I'm going to take welding. And I'm going to come out and I'm going to get me a good job making good money. And I'm getting me and daddy out of here. He was determined to get away from it. She was losing a grip on him. That they were moving on with their life growing up. Was it possible that an unhealthy need for control, coupled with a potentially crippling mental illness, could push Susan to do the unthinkable? Or did Susan have a more calculating motive for murder? As investigators pour through evidence collected at the scene, a possible answer emerges. We find this big red notebook, and once we pull it out, it is labeled by name as insurance policies for all of the victims. When we start totaling up all these insurance policies, you total up to over $750,000. 
In addition to the notebook, a background check reveals that Susan had actually filed for bankruptcy in 2008. She was the primary beneficiary, which was kind of interesting because this, this entire family is on a relatively fixed income. And there's hundreds of dollars being paid each month on life insurance policies for some people that aren't even gainfully employed. You have all this circumstantial evidence that's starting to build. But there's one piece of evidence that detectives can't readily explain. The suicide note written by Matthew's own hand. It turns out that Matthew had written that note, but it was like a Mother's Day letter from that year or the year before, or many years before. Then, on October 20th, 2011, investigators received the results of the gunshot residue test performed on the clothing Susan was wearing at the time of the crime. They had found significant particles of gunshot residue on the shirt that Susan Hendricks was wearing. This was more than just potentially her coming in contact with the firearm or her coming in contact with somebody who discharged a firearm. It was more so her having been present when the gun is discharged. And that changed everything. Based on the GSR findings, as well as the other physical evidence collected at the scene, investigators begin to piece together their theory of how these murders were likely committed. Matthew Hendricks was likely shot first in his sleep. Linda Burns was likely shot second. Based on the blood droplets that we found, it indicates that Linda probably, following the first shooting, did not die. Susan then went to the residence at Pinedale. Mark Hendricks, he's laying on his back on a couch to sleep when this occurred with Marshall. His attempt to flee would indicate that he was fully aware of what was transpiring. It wasn't a stranger, which I, that would be hard, but to know the person that was doing this to you. I couldn't imagine having to fight with my mother, knowing that if I lose this fight, I'm gonna die. I think he made the vital mistake of seeing his daddy and stopping for a minute. And that's when she shot him. Detectives believe Susan then covered Marshall's body and headed back to her house, where she realized the job wasn't quite finished. Susan saw the blood on the floor and found Linda in the closet, cut her out of the closet, laid her on the bed, and shot at least four to five more times. We can't leave with no witnesses. Susan got the note and staged it somewhere in the scene as kind of a confession from him or a you know, goodbye letter from him. We finally had enough evidence that we, along with the solicitor's office, knew that we could prosecute this case. Susan Hendricks at the time was staying in a, a local hotel in Easley, South Carolina. We went down there, knocked on the door. I stepped in and informed her that she was under arrest for the murder of Marshall Hendricks, Mark Hendricks, Matthew Hendricks, and Linda Burns. That was really very, very shocking because she had been playing the grieving mother, the grieving family member. I remember all of us, my mom, my sister, going and seeing Susan, who had just did this, walk down between us in chains and knowing to us that that wasn't enough. She's still here. The case against Susan Hendricks for the murder of her two sons, ex-husband and stepmother, focused on one central question. Were these murders caused by mental illness? Or was money her motive? For her to even contemplate doing what she did, it blows my mind. I'll never understand. In pretrial motions, prosecutors contend Susan's motive was financial gain. However, several of the victim's family members believe the story is more nuanced. I think a lot of it was her mental health issues and not getting help for him when she needed to. Matthew 
was fixing to move away with Daddy, and Marshall was fixing to get married and move out with Kelsey. I think she felt like she was losing control of her life, as she had known it for so many years, and she wasn't going to let that happen. Some family members of the victims believe Susan was likely in the depths of a depressive episode the night of the crime. And as the case inches closer to trial, the debate over Susan's mental health intensifies. The mental health professional's testimony was that Susan had developed several personalities and that one of those personalities had been in control that night during the actual shootings. They emphasized that Susan herself knows right from wrong. But this, this aspect of her personality, this, this different, separate personality, did not. Would Susan's mental illness be enough for a judge to remand her to a mental health facility rather than make her stand trial for her crimes? On April 26, 2013, Susan's defense enters a plea. Susan Hendricks' lawyers entered for her. The guilty but insane plea. The judge accepts her plea and sentences Susan to life without the possibility of parole. It was clear from the get-go that once Susan was arrested, she was never going to be a free woman again. So I think that helped with the family. To know that she's in jail is not any really consolation for me because I'm still paying to feed her and to keep her alive every day when she took the life of the ones that I loved. I've said numerous times she didn't just take her boys and my uncle that day. And Miss Linda, she took all of us. She stole that happiness that I grew up with and, and had and watched and she stole all that from my children because they don't get to have that now because half of their family's gone. You can't replace that with anything except for the memories of the joy that you had with each other, the friendship and what they meant. And they just carry on in your hearts.